Ladies and gentlemen, we now direct your attention to Commissioner Kuhn's box, situated at the home plate side of the Reds' dugout, where the ceremonial first pitch will be thrown out by the widow of the inspirational leader of the 1961 National League champion Cincinnati Reds, Mrs. Fred Hutchinson. Patsy Hutchinson will throw out the first ball. What a lovely lady. Johnny Bench will take one more. Baseball certainly remains a big part of the Hutchinson family. Jack, the second of the three sons and one daughter, one time played in the Red System, is now the assistant director of stadium operations for the Brewers. Rick, the oldest son, a former player at Florida State, Another, right behind him, one of the Hutchinson boys. Chubb Feeney next to Patsy. Doesn't seem possible that Fred has been gone since November 12, 1964, but certainly <laughs> memorialized with the Cancer Research Center in Seattle. There go the Reds. Tony, it's amazing when you look at this field, and Marty, you've seen it so often. The rain came down, that big uh, squeegee comes out, and look how dry it is. It's Italian. You should have pronounced it. What is it called? A Zamboni? Zamboni machine. And, uh, <laughs> Joe, you and I were talking before the broadcast tonight that they have never had an official game rained out here. They had a second game of a doubleheader a few years back. They had a game stopped at the end of five innings last year, a tie game with Atlanta, but never an official date rained out since they moved in here in 1970. Fred Norman, little guy who was used in middle relief, he and Billingham kind of swapped positions. He's digging it out there, boy. Get him a rake and a shovel. Tony, I know that Larry Shepard, the pitching coach, you were there visiting with him. Looks like before he starts, he's going to be like the doctor. He's going to have everything ready. You talk to Larry Shepard about Fred Norman. Right, I asked Larry about his pitching style. He's been very consistent for the Reds. We talked to him before the ball game, and here's their pitching coach, Larry Shepard. Well, uh, he has all the pitches, Tony. I think that uh, with the curveball, the screwball, the fastball, the straight change, uh, plus the fact that he has control of all his pitches, and uh, I think this is going to give them trouble. I don't know about you, Tony, but my favorite shot of these four is the one in the upper right-hand corner because I like to know what that pitcher's looking at when he starts to throw. And Norman, like a lot of them, and this shot proves it, they look down at the ground. Watch when he delivers. No, well, he was looking straight ahead that time. Time before he did. That'd make me feel better as a hitter, wouldn't you? <laughs> they say he has a little bit of a problem uh, when he tries to nibble too much. If he tries to be too cute, tries to nibble on the corners, he can get behind. We heard Larry Shepard talk about his screwball, slow curve. And I think his fastball is more deceptive sometimes, Marty, than people give him credit for. It is, Tony, because of his off-speed pitches. You mentioned his screwball and his, uh, his curveball, and... And when he gets those pitches over and they're working effectively for him, it does, uh, his fastball is deceptively quick. Would you expect a lot of ground balls if he's got his good stuff? Absolutely, uh, Joe. And uh, Tony mentioned the fact that he has been guilty many times this season of nibbling. And it's a tremendous problem for Freddie. He can roll along maybe giving up two, three hits over maybe a six-inning span and all of a sudden completely lose it because I know as Sparky comments, he's thinking too much out there. <laughs> Don't want you to think, want you to throw. And there's his 1975 statistics in his lifetime, 52 and 57. Fred Norman has bounced around, but here he is in the major leagues. 15th pro season, here is Juan Beniquez, who is known as a fastball first ball hitter. You might say that about most of these Red Sox. An aggressive club. Takes it high, ball one. Manager Daryl Johnson made a change in his lineup with Benikas in left field and Yastrzemski at first base. Two balls and no strikes. Dick Stello is behind the plate. George Maloney is at first base. Satch Davison is second. Art France is at third. Larry Barnett is in right field. Colossi is in left field. That's the umpire in alignment. Three and oh, three balls and no strikes. What makes a pitcher so good? There's Zimmer at third base. What makes a pitcher so good in one park and not so good in another? He's got a tremendous home record, doesn't he, Marty? 22 and 6, lifetime, and he's been a below 500 pitcher on the road. There's his strike. 
I don't know. I, I've seen pitches like that. You have to make you wonder as Zimmer flashes the sign. And, and I tell you, if he coaches like he usually does, this guy's hitting. Johnson, he turns him loose. Norman falls behind hitters, and that'll get you in trouble. Wants a new baseball. I love that. Now, the umpire put it in his pocket. Two pitches later, going to give him the same ball. It's going to be all right. Uh, the pitchers tell me they can tell. That little seam is out of place. Oh, sure. They tell me that, too. <laughs> you believe them? I believe you. <laughs> You're sitting right next to me. They're not. <laughs> Straight away center field. Geronimo has plenty of room. One away, and it brings up Denny Doyle. Joe and Marty, you've got to wonder uh, what kind of attitude the Red Sox are going into this after they lost two consecutive games, both of which they might have won. A little bit base running that may have been a little bit too risky. Well, I'll tell you, Johnny Bench wasn't that happy about the victory. He was a little bit upset last night. He said, we were lucky to win it, very lucky to win it. He said, we uh, made some bad plays, and I hope it woke us up. Hits his bat at strike one. No score, just underway. Denny Doyle, four for 12, hitting 310. This little guy has really done a job. The slider way outside. You got a good look at that slider as it broke quickly. He's got a from a great hometown, isn't he, Marty? What is it? Caves Creek or something? Caves Creek. We got a lot of people up here uh, in support of Denny Doyle, Joe. He's a graduate of Moorhead State University, and a lot of his old college chums are here at Riverfront Stadium tonight to see him play. You figure Caves Creek is uh, they turned down the stop and go light, and they're all here? <laughs> One of my favorite towns. Here's a pitch. He didn't have a good cut at that ball. It looked like he was fooled on that pitch by Norman. Two balls and two strikes, one out. Marty, what kind of fielder is uh, Freddie Norman? He's not a bad fielder, Tony. He's done a pretty good job this season. Fielded some, uh, did some fine fielding plays, turned in some fine fielding plays against Pittsburgh in his last start in the league championship series. 2-2 two -two pitch. Morgan. Two outs. I like the way he shakes off a pitch. He really sneers it off. You know, he gives you that tough upper lip. He sneers at you. Be surprised how many funny faces pitchers make. And sometimes you're down in the crouch. I used to have to laugh sometimes. They just give you, they don't mean it, you know, but they're just bearing down so much. I guess their expression depends a lot upon whom they've got to look in at. <laughs> I didn't mean that. Yes, you did. You really did, Tony. Here's Yastrzemski. Two for 11 in this series. Takes a fastball high. Boy, he was out there mighty early. Bus got out there about 5 o'clock. He had taken a cab an hour or so earlier. They're ready. Good cut of the fastball. One ball, one strike. There's the on deck hitter, and he'll get quite a reception when he comes up. Carlton Fisk. They look like they're playing Yastrzemski over more to pull toward the right field line than they did before. I guess they're going to try and pitch him inside or maybe some breaking balls. There's a good shot of it. You can always gauge it by the center fielder. Geronimo's in right center, and look at Concepcion, the shortstop. Hit it to right field. It's a base hit. Got a curveball off, and he just kind of stroked it oh so gently. Yastrzemski is on. And that brings up Carlton Fisk. Well, I'll tell you, if I'd have been catching, I believe I'd have made the same kind of a beat. Because I, I only changed my mind after watching the replay about 18 times today. Not too bad. I thought it'd be worse than it is, Marty. These fans didn't give it to him too badly. No, they really didn't, Joe, and it was somewhat surprising, but I guess the biggest reason was the fact that uh, 
it was a play that had the Reds ultimately coming out on top in the ball game, but he really put up quite a storm at home plate. Carlton Fisk. There's his strike. He's two for nine. One home run, three runs batted in. He's been a good hitter for the Red Sox in this series. He got it going last night. Tremendous home run. One and one. Mrs. Fisk. She just keeps up that applause. <laughs> ah, the lonely life of the pretty wives. Come on, Pudge. Curveball is the beauty. He dropped the curveball in there off speed. And there is Larry Barnett, who was involved in the play last night. He's along the right field line. He was behind the plate last night. Out on strike. Fisk on a screwball. So the Red Sox do not score in the top of the first. We go to the bottom half. No score. And there he is, Luis Tiant. And Mrs. Tiant. What in the world is that? <laughs> <laughs> Man, she came prepared, didn't she? <laughs> Beautiful. Fans are, are going to have some fun watching Louis pitch here tonight. Oh, I tell you, he is something to watch. We warn you ahead. There'll be nothing wrong with your fine tuning knob. He'll be out of focus. <laughs> here he comes. Fastball is a strike. You remember he threw a slow curveball to Pete Rose that had him kind of talking to himself. Makes you wonder if he'll be up there looking for it. Three for 12 in the series. No score. One and one. Rose hit the ball hard off him up in Bosnia. Three balls on the nose. There's that slow oh, curve. He's waiting for it. He too. was waiting for it. Yes, sir. And still couldn't oh, do look much at with it. <laughs> he's talking to himself. Joe, you talk about Tiot's motion in relation to Pete. Tony made the comment about the three hard hit balls. Pete said that. Louis Tion's head could roll off toward the first base foul line as he delivered to the plate. He wouldn't even notice it. Say he is something. One two pitch. Fastball and he had to fight it off. He comes from over the top. He gets a little extra on it it seems. The thing about him he's got six different pitches. He throws a knuckleball when he's really ahead but it's not only the pitches that he has it's the angle from which they come. Outside, two and two. Two balls, two strikes on Pete Rose. No score. Bottom of the first. Game four. Ball three. Breaking ball. Three balls, two strikes. Tian has been outstanding in five of his last six starts. His last six starts, he's allowed five earned runs in 48 and two thirds inning. That's an earned run average of 0 0.92. Amazing. Payoff pick. Pretty good fastball. He's going to need it tonight. He usually has pretty good control, too. He can spot the ball with all of his pitches. He walks two or three a game. Look at those statistics, Tony. 27 hits, six runs, five earned, three shutouts. Boy, boy. That bottom line. Oh. That they pay off on. Up the middle. It's a base hit. Tiant, because of his follow through, was not ready and it got through there. This telecast is presented by Authority of Major League Baseball, is intended solely for the private, non commercial use of our audience. Any publication, reproduction, retransmission, or other use of the pictures. Descriptions and accounts of this game without the express written consent of the Commissioner of Baseball is prohibited. Major League Baseball has the right of approval of the announcers for this event. Joe, you might take a close look at Pete Rose here as Ken Griffey steps in. Sparky Anderson made the comment earlier tonight that something may be going if he gets on initially. Well, he's on. Not too big a lead. There he goes. Left center field. That's going to pluck the gap. Rose will score easily. Here he comes. 
There goes Trippy for third. They're going to have a shot at him. In time, they got him. Once again, the Boston Red Sox with fundamentally sound basic baseball. Hitting the cutoff man who got the ball in good shape. Fine relay throw as we look at Lynn all the way over left center to Rick Pearlson, the cutoff man. Look at our friends, the third base umpire. He's eating dust right along with Petroselli and Griffey. Good relay. Great execution, Joe. That was just perfect, boy. That's page 10 of the Spalding Guide if you want to know how you make relay plays. Lynn gave it to Burleson. Burleson a one-hopper, which is an easy ball for the infield and the handle. And Bongo, they got the man. Pedro scores. It's one nothing. Here is Joe Morgan. Hit and run play. Marty, you hit it right on the head. You said something would happen. It didn't take long. Ball one. Wrinkle those socks. Two balls, no strikes. A single by Rose and a double by Griffey, and it's one nothing, Cincinnati. Nothing pitch. Strike is called. Burleson, the shortstop, really over towards the back. A lot of room between Burleson and Petroselli. Look at that. Man, he drives two, three. Whew. Now we'll see it. What do you think, Tony? Well, let's hear what Joe Morgan says. We uh, had a little audio tape or videotape with him before the game. We asked him what about Luis Tion's move. Let's hear what little Joe's got to say about Luis Tion. Well, Tony, Louis has a quick move at first, which is a legitimate move, and he also has a balk move at first. And he interchanges the two, and I think it throws the umpires off a little bit. His balk move, he starts his throw to first base without stepping, and on his regular move, he does step. What a lead Joe's got. He's got a big lead as Perez waits. They throw it oh. back. He just made it. Dropped the ball. You can tell the big lead because Morgan can get at least one foot on the artificial surface. That's the yardstick. Pete Rose, when he broke, did not have, he was in the dirt area. But watch Morgan. If you can get to the artificial surface, you got yourself a good lead. There he goes measuring again. Back there, he, he read that pretty good. That wasn't as close. Morgan's come out and said that he's not going to be thrown out anymore the rest of this series. Tian jiggles, comes from different positions, and look at the lead. Man, we got some battle going here now. Say what you want, and Perez has to wait. Morgan continues to defy Tiant by getting a big lead. Tiant challenging him. Cat and mouse. Holding. Foul back. Boy, I guarantee you now, when you look in the box score, all that happened there was a foul ball, but you never saw a more exciting moment than the Tiant trying to get Morgan. Basketball right down the middle, and that's the benefit that a bench or a Tony Perez get when Morgan's on base. Not many breaking balls. Lack of concentration by the pitcher going home. You see some balls popped in the situation. I think what they do, they rely more on throwing strikes than they're throwing outside corner strikes. Here we go again. Look at Morgan's lead on that surface. One strike. Pitch out. Nothing happening. Morgan says he loves it. He said he can read pitch outs. That man goes quicker to home. That's all he needs. He does. He stops his tracks. Doesn't even break. He didn't break at all. But look out now. Holding. Bouncing ball. Burleson's only play at first base. In time. 
Nice play by Yastrzemski at first base. George Maloney, the umpire, a double call to make sure that everybody knew he was out. Burleson made a good play on that ball. He did, throwing off balance, couldn't get much on it as he was going a little bit away from first base. Johnny Bench with the score of 1-0, Cincinnati. Singled by Rose, doubled by Griffey, and that snapped Tian's streak of no earned runs in his last 27 innings. Johnny Bench, 3 for 12 in the World Series. They won't give him too much to hit with first base open. High ball one. The on deck batter is George Foster, a good hitter, but not the threat to hit one out of here that Johnny Bench is. And there you see Foster. Morgan just kind of cruising around second base. Boy, that's when he's the most dangerous. One and one. Perez and Bench have had a couple of pretty good swings, just missing. There's that's been said a lot in this game, hadn't he? Just missed it. Just didn't get it all. More often than I just got it. <laughs> Tell you, man, they really play it deep. Look at Burleson, the shortstop, way back there. He may have to hit a relay, man, to get it to first. High fastball. Got to believe John White in his strike zone tried to drive that run, and that was not a good strike. It was a good pitch by Tian. Marty, how much did that shoulder injury bother Johnny Bench during the course of the year? Tony, it bothered him a lot more than he let people think it did. Uh, actually, at one point, it got so bad that he had to go to Sparky Anderson and said, look, I've got to sit down for a while and give it rest. He had a number of shots to try to alleviate the problem. One-two pitch. All right. Two and two, two outs, one run in. We're in the bottom of the first. Tian hasn't given that whirling dervish kind of move where he kicks his leg at base runner Morgan in second base. But do for it. Right center field, slow curveball, and it drops for the extra base. Morgan scores easily. Bench has a double. That ball seemed to hang up there a long time. And Evans and Lynn gave it a chase. Couldn't seem to catch up with it. 2 nothing, Cincinnati. Valley well, said up in Fenway that they wouldn't be able to play as shallow as Mr. and Mrs. Johnny Bench in the stands. Here's Freddie Lynn. He and Evans have not moved back too much since coming over from Fenway, but they got hurt by Pete Rose yesterday. This ball hung up, as you said, Joe, but they were playing relatively shallow, couldn't get to it. What a great shot from center field to see the action of the outfielders. I think there was more indecision in misjudging it. What great hitting by Bench, too. An off-speed pitch, you expect him to pull it, maybe even foul, but he was going the other way all the way. Here is George Foster now, two nothing ball game. Cincinnati out in front. Break one, breaking ball. A lot of room in the outfield here, and Johnny Bench took the pitch to the opposite field. He has given the Cincinnati Reds their second run in this inning. Fastball inside. One ball, one strike. Looked like they want to take the fastball and lay for the off-speed stuff. And go the other way with it. Mm -hmm. You know, Rose got the first off-speed pitch he got. He went for it. Bench hit it. Perez went after it, dribbled it. Perez dribbled it. Field. One one pitch. Curveball is a beauty. Overhand curveball. Johnny Bench at second base. Two runs in. We're in the bottom of the first. Tian.
Good fastball. Got it up and in. Two balls, two strikes. They're very shifted way over for Foster. Yastrzemski at first base way wide of the bag as Concepcion waits. There's a good shot of defense. Look at Yastrzemski how far he is from the bag. Two-two pitch. Calls it back. Never forget the All-Star game in Washington. Here, Bill Dickey was president, the great Hall of Famer, and he was talking about Bench. He said he had seen him on television. He was he just raved about the strength he had and still had the great soft hands, his agility. He said, well, everybody knows it by now. He's going to be in the Hall of Fame. This is one of the first years Bench was in the majors. He may be in the Hall of Fame while he's still playing. Mm -hmm. Way outside, three and two. I tell you, it's it's guys like Bench and Morgan, and, well, Yastrzemski, even Fred Lynn, Jim Rice, who answered the question: Are the ball players of today as good as the ball players of your time? Listen, if you could play, you can play in 1776 or 1976. If you can't play, better hope your father buys the team. Here's the payoff pitch, Deonta Foster. Hot smash to Petroselli, but he was right there guarding the line. Stremski, nice play, almost pulled him off the bag. At the end of an inning, Cincinnati 2, Boston nothing. Split screen as we see Sparky Anderson on the left, Daryl Johnson on your right. Sparky's very superstitious. He always has Alex Grammas to his right when the opposition is batting. To his left, I'm sure, is George Sugar. Daryl Johnson is kind of sitting there. Two contrasting personalities managing these teams. Sparky's bubbling all the time, willing to talk to anybody, and Daryl Johnson not rude, but he's been kind of short with his answers. Simple yeses and noes. Although I guess you said more than yes or no yesterday in that 10th inning. <laughs> I kind of think he did, Tony. Here's Fred Lynn, 3 for 11 in the series. Against Fred Norman, Red Sox trail 2-0, top of the second. Ball one. Lynn trying to draw Pete Rose in. Petroselli, who has really been a hot hitter. Petroselli, six base hits. Petroselli and Burleson tied for the Red Sox lead in hits. There's a strike. We pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC television network. One one pitch. Look at that bench. He scooped that up like picking cherries. Watch, watch him just grab that ball like it's a tweezer, a giant tweezer. Hello there. He's got a magnet in that glove, Tony. Isn't that something? When a catcher does that, the pitcher never looks wild. Down the left field line, maybe playable. It's near the stands and into the stands. You know, some catchers will make a pitcher look wild. They're jumping around and moving. Bench. Nobody just, ever looks wild. He's the kind of guy you want to say, well, he can do it all. Then you say, well, he doesn't run too well. But then you look at what he's done, 12 of 12. He's an excellent base runner. I think the best yardstick you can use on the franchise, and that's what he is, is that when a young catcher comes up, and I hear it so often, he's a young Johnny Bench. And then you look at Johnny Bench, the young catcher's older than him. <laughs> Never thought of it that way. <laughs> 2-2 two, two pitch. How many times have you heard it? Young guy comes up yeah. and says, oh, this guy's a young Johnny Bench. He's 28. Bench is 26. Three balls, two strikes on Fred Lynn. They're going to be saying the same thing about Lynn. High curveball. He chased it, missed it. Strike three. And that's the second strikeout for Norman. Two in a row. Rico Petroselli. Petroselli is 6 for 11. Three runs batted in. Fisk and Petroselli have a club lead in RBIs. There's one right there. He just struck out Lynn. The ball is passed around the infield. He changed balls. Superstition, Marty? Yeah, he does that quite a bit during the course of the game, Tony. What does he figure? Some uh, witch doctor? One of those idiosyncrasies of a left-hander, Joe. <laughs> You put it nicely. <laughs> <laughs> That's the high rent district way of saying they're flaky, huh? Yeah. He's bearing down. Look at oh, I love the way. Oh man, he sneers. 
There's a broken bat base hit for Petroselli, and in my book, there's no such thing as a cheap hit. They're all too tough to get, and Petroselli now has his seventh base hit of the World Series. Might have been a screwball that Rico got off the end of the bat. Looked like pretty good location. That's the pitch that used to get Rico out very easily when he was a big slugger. Kept the ball away. Now he goes the opposite way at times with that pitch. He did hit that ball right on the end of the bat. You could see it. Here is Dwight Evans, who was a hero for a couple of minutes last night. Hit a big home run to tie it up. Evans is three for ten. One man out, two nothing. Cincinnati leading top of the second. Fastball. Bench wanted to know where it was. And there is Rick Burleson. He's one of those bear down guys in the on deck circle. Takes his stance and tries to time the pitcher. Bouncing ball of Concepcion to Morgan. One, that's all they're going to get. Evans can run. Two outs. Rick Burleson is a batter. Joe, I think uh, what tells a little bit of the story of the kind of competitor that Freddie Norman is, he was peeved when he was passed up for the second game up in Boston. I know a lot of left-handed pitchers... Uh, what a pass up, Fenway Park, Boston. That's one of those parks that left-handers get bad backs, isn't it? Ooh. Ten good hits next. and 20 times at bat. That's pretty good in the postseason play uh, games. Burleson, first pitch once again. This time it's Rose who comes over and makes the play. Going to say Concepcion, but Pete Rose covered a lot of ground. Ends the inning. We go to the bottom. Of, here it comes. We talked about on the play he made this way yesterday going to his left. He considers this his best play. What an adjustment he's had to make and do it well and never lost his hitting either. So it's 2 nothing as we go in the bottom half of the second inning. Cincinnati in front. Dave Concepcion leads it off against Luis Tian. That was a tough first inning for Tian. Made 28 pitches to the plate. Three more pitches at first base when Morgan was on. That's a lot of pitches for him. Fastball is a strike. Concepcion had some problems with Tian in Boston. Then who didn't? He won that game 6 nothing. Strike two. Headlines in Venezuela this morning. For, I understand. with the front page. Concepcion's picture full page. Concepcion, the hero of the game. He's something. It's the way it should be. Hot smash to Petroselli. Played him perfectly. One up, one down. Petroselli has been as steady a ball player as you want. He's hitting, he's fielding, getting on base, and just kind of doing it in a quiet, positive way. Still insists he might quit and call this his last year. Boy, you would hate to see that happen with the kind of a series he's having. Here's Geronimo, two for eight, hit a big home run last night. Basketball misses. Another one of those oddities in this series. A small ballpark, two games, no home runs. Last night they were flying out of here, six of them. Big ballpark. There's that slow curve hit off the end of the bat. Doyle. So Geronimo is out. What would you do, Tony, if you were batting against a guy like Tian as you watch it? I think I might do what Cincinnati's trying to do. They're taking the fastball and going after the off-speed spin. Look at Louie, another change-up curveball. Geronimo was looking for an off-speed pitch, but he still hit it on the end of the bat. That pitch, he seemed to sling it. One of those frozen shoulder jobs. Of course, he looked seven different directions before he threw it, too, which can be a little distracting. Here is Norman, not a bad hitter. Louie tells a great story on his dad, the former great left-handed Cuban pitcher. There's Rose pitching in the polo grounds. He apparently had a great fastball and also a great move to first base. And he threw over to first base. The hitter swung and missed. Threw his bat down in disgust. Told the umpire, I never saw the ball. And then, now listen to this. I was Wait looking for a ball minute. player's excuse. He reconsidered and said, I thought I got a piece of it. <laughs> Deion plays. It's a true story. He threw the first. The, the guy swung, swung and went back to the bench and said, Louis, I thought I got a piece of it. He said, I got a piece of it. Louis claims it's true. Left field. 
Benicus is where he makes the play. I'm going to have to ask Satchel Page about that. That sounds like his kind of story. So at the end of two, Cincinnati two, Boston nothing. We'll be back here for game number five tomorrow night of the 1975 World Series. Joe Garagiola's baseball world will be on, and you've got Max Patkin. He's Max been in every Patkin. park in the world. That's right. You know, he's the last of his breed, which it all began, at least in my memory, with Al Shack as the clown prince. And Max, who does a very physical show, we went to Rochester, filmed him, and I think you'll enjoy it. I don't think there's going to be any more after Max. Here is Tiant to lead it off. We're in the third inning. Her ball, and they're treating him with respect, and they should because it was Tian as Benicas swings that bat in the on deck circle. Tian got himself a base hit when they were at Fenway. And it's ball two. And he almost missed, he did miss home plate as he came around and he went back and tagged it. Two balls and no strikes. Ball three. I tell you, it's easy to see why they would love this fella, especially in Boston. You've got to like him. He's a bear down guy, gives you everything he's got. 3 0 pitch. Ball four draws the walk. And that'll send Sparky Anderson to the water cooler, I guarantee you. That'll make you stir at least. Hiroshi used to always go to the water cooler. There he is. There's his uh, superstitious lineup. Graham is to his right. That's Sparky Anderson with his leg crossed, which is another one of his superstitions. Sharker, the coach, has to sit up there off his left shoulder, and Larry Shepard to the right of Grammis. Sure has worked. <laughs> it sure has, especially <laughs> if you've got good hitters. There is Norman sneering off a pitch, and Benicus hasn't taken his eyes off him. Look at the concentration on Benicus. Group ball. Let's see if their eyes meet. I mean by that, after he gets the sign, if Benicus will pick him up right away, Tony. He's got it. Another one, same pitch. Two strikes. Luis Tian is the base runner at first. Here we go. Benicus with a count of strike two. Good spot. Three screw balls in a row. Benicus, as you obviously can tell by those first three pitches, respected as a fastball hitter. Tony playing behind Luis Tian at first. One two pitch now. Fouled off. I'll tell you that Cecil Cooper played behind Perez last night, and old Tony took off. And what made a difference. It. Yeah. Could have been the third out. Had he been thrown out, bench would have never come up. Everybody on this club looks for that green light, whether it's hitting or on the bases, and Sparky Anderson usually giving it. Foul ball, it's out of play. He's really spotting that ball well. He's keeping the ball the outside part of the plate. He walks about four per nine innings. Been more of a strikeout pitcher than you'd suspect a little like guy like he is would be. Strikes almost six out per nine innings. So far tonight he's got two. There's the on deck batter, Denny Doyle. Nobody out. Lined over the dugout. He just again, that's that good fastball in and that good hitter when he can't handle it, he just fouls it off. Benik is noted to be a pretty good offensive player. They felt he'll hit around 300, pop a home run once in a while, has a chance to be a good base stealer. They're trying to find a position for him. If he can hit, they'll find one. Off the end of the bat, but it's going to sneak through. Whoa, Louis. Tian, <laughs> he made that <laughs> left turn. <laughs> Louis had some experience this year being on base. That was the first game of the World Series. 
Almost gets nipped by the ball. <laughs> You're going in the right direction, Louie. Don't round it too far at second. <laughs> Tell you, the other day in Boston, we got off first. They gave him a jacket and a road map. Now he's looking like he's going to get some ideas. <laughs> Throw a lasso on him. That's it. He's just one of those guys that makes things happen when he's around him. As the base hit to right field, almost hits him. He Gian, scores, yes. well, misses home plate. Something's always happening. He's an exciting kind of guy. So it's first and second. Now here's Denny Doyle. Doyle bounced out his first time up, and they're moving in on him at first and third. They're looking for the bunt. He squares around, and then, whoops, look out there. The he Cincinnati infield was doing a little decoy in there, too. They were creeping in at the corners, and Concepcion was way over toward the back. That's where he was now. But as soon as Norman started pitching, they backed up on the left side a little bit. Remember, it was Doyle who slapped the ball by Rose in one of the ball games earlier. He's got a lot of room between Concepcion and Rose. Ball one to count. Center field, Geronimo covering over fast and makes the play. The ball was well hit, but he was very shallow. He covered a lot of ground. The kind of situation you would expect Doyle to bunt, Joe. I thought he was going to bunt all the way, but they put so much pressure at the corners on this artificial surface, didn't feel he could do it successfully. Johnson, one of those uh, managers who plays pretty conservative, but again, that uh, pressure from... Rose and Perez just took the bunt right away from him. So I haven't seen that conservative play by Johnson. I think he's really well, I mean, had his guys going uh, on the base pass. Yeah. The only guy he really didn't bunt with we expected was Yaz. And he said he would have bunted with him last night if he got one strike. Oh, he's not conservative on the bases at all. Or 3-0. and oh. Bouncing ball to Morgan. There's one. And there's two. Double play. 4-6-3. And the crowd loves it. Here's the play once again. Two nothing. Cincinnati leading. Tony, here's that double play again. You gotta love the way Morgan gives you that ball. You see right here why David Concepcion's son's middle name is Alexander after Alex Kramis, who spent so much time working on him with just that specific play, among many others. A lot of hours put in trying to refine his double play technique. Certainly has refined it to the point that he's got it down perfectly. Here is Rose. He singled and scored the first run. Single to center field. Hit hard. Center field. Lynn is there. Boy, he jumped on the first pitch and really drilled it. Can't say he fooled him with that one. Here is Griffey. Griffey double to left center field to drive in Rose, but then was out on a tremendous play by Lynn to Burleson to Petroselli. Ken Griffey, 318 his last 44 games. Ted Klazuski simply says he's our Ralph Gar with power. And I think that pretty well says it all. There's the strike. Joe Morgan in the on-deck battle, in the on-deck circle. Marty, I think everybody around here feels that Griffey has the potential to be another Joe Morgan. He's got a little bit of power. Clue says he might hit 20 home runs someday. And, of course, he's got the great speed. That's right, Tony. He, last year, had a terrible habit of going after bad pitches. And they worked that with him on spring training. And he seemed to really cut down on that on that problem during the regular season. Primarily, one at good pitches, and it, and it really paid off for him. He's up to now with a 1-1 count. What a pitch that was. I got a question for you, Joe. All right. If you had had Griffey's speed as a player, what might you have done? <laughs> probably an artificial <laughs> surface, too. Oh, that, too. You could I have probably, it all. I probably would hit a hard 260. That way, Park's wall in right field for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's the one two pitch. A hard 260. <laughs> hard 260. <laughs> What's Any, a hard 260? <laughs> anything I hit's hard, man. <laughs> <laughs> two balls and two strikes on Griffey. In addition to not being able to hit, I also couldn't run. <laughs> right back to Tian. He's got this one and over to first. You had a hard four base hits one World Series. Don't discount that. 
Uh, you can catch lightning in a bottle once in a while, Tony. Here is Morgan. Boy, I tried to figure out the pitchers that would give him the most trouble when he was on bases. You know who's at the very top of his list, not playing now? Pete Rickard. Remember Rickard? Yeah. He had Sanders. a good move. Dodgers. He made it tough on Morgan. Out of play. Joe says the toughest right-hander in baseball is Andy Messersmith. And, of course, one of the top-throwing catchers is Steve Yeager, the Dodgers. And yet Joe went 13 for 13 stolen bases against the Dodgers. The moral of that story is... Don't believe a base stealer. <laughs> One strike pitch. Ooh, he had some ideas on that slow pitch. Well, Morgan simply says, nobody's going to stop me from stealing. Some make it tougher than others. There was a... Oh, I, that pitch is a tough pitch to handle. He missed the inside corner, but he shoots for the belt buckle. There's nothing you can do with it, and he really twisted and turned on that one. He took a good look at the center field bleachers. Here's a shot from behind the pitcher. Here's what it's going to look like, the outfield. You know, Tony, it's a funny thing. As a, as a catcher, all the years you spend with the ball coming towards you, but the infielders and outfielders, it's going away from you. You know what I'm saying? Makes a lot of sense so far. I know, but, I mean, it's a different perspective, like when you sit in a ballpark. Like right now, this is where the infielder would see it. Right? Yeah. I mean, a catcher's view, it's always going to come to him, so it's, it, you're not leaning forward. I know. It's the same thing with adding <laughs> with the catcher. It's that theory you got get it, man. Pop, pop. I can see that blank look. It's like it's a look you get when you start to blow up the footballs. I know. <laughs> that ball's well hit. But you, uh, Finikas is out there this time and makes the play. So you see Yastrzemski, he had it covered well. Three up and three down. It's 2 nothing, Cincinnati. Top of the fourth, 2 0 Cincinnati out in front and with our handheld camera. There it is. Now, that's a spot. See, I would All sit right. there, and the reason I would sit there is so I could watch the third baseman throw the ball as opposed to sitting at first base and watch the ball come towards me. I can get you that job. I'll call Corey Leibel, the guy carting that camera around. You can have his job. I don't want his job. <laughs> Norman against Carlton Fisk. It would be easy to say right now, Joe, that Boston is down, but it's the World Series, and I know they're not. They know what they've been through this entire year with Baltimore in pursuit. No way. The only way they're down is on that scoreboard. They're trailing by two, and they're going to try to get some runs. You don't get down. You play it in the series. Fastball is high, ball one. I'll tell you one, there is uh, Fred Lynn. I'll tell you one thing, that Rose is way back to a third base. He's going to have some trouble if he does come up with the ball. Long throw for him. Two balls, no strikes. He's had some arm problems, too. The shoulder, Marty? Well, he had some elbow problems, elbow? Tony, but he, going into the playoffs, he said they had completely cleared up for him. 3 and all. Norman behind. It's 2 nothing. Every time those Red Sox get a runner on, that time runs at the plate, and they got some gunners. There's the strike. Dick Stello raises that right hand and strike like he's posing for that baking soda head. Big, powerful arm up there. 3-1 pitch. Well hit, in the gap, left center field. Could be extra base, but look at Geronimo get over there and cut that ball off. Fine defensive play, and there's that raw speed Flex was talking about. I'll tell you, Joe, Tony, he can do it. He is considered by many to be the best center fielder in the National League, and as you mentioned, on artificial surface, it makes it all the more difficult as you see him sweep deep into the gap and left center field to cut that ball off and really recover and get a quick throw off to the infield to keep Carlton Fisk to a long single. You could see from that outfield camera following him how far he got over in that gap. And that's what Sparky was talking about, that raw speed. Because when it hits that artificial surface, it really jumps. And here's Lynn, who was out on strikes. Strike one, foul tip. Geronimo's fun to watch from up here because you can see the ball hit the bat and you can see his movement. 
something you can't see when you're down at ground level. You've got to watch the ball off the bat like a tennis match. But we can see it both from up here. And he's moving even on a foul ball, getting the jump. You know, he's going to get in a position sometime tonight when he's going to be right in line with our camera, and we'll be able to take a sneak preview. Way outside. He's way over now in right center field. Not way over, but he's towards the right field side of the bag. You line up according to the second base bag. It's one ball and one strike, two nothing. Whoops, little flip throw. Nobody out. Two nothing. Cincinnati leading. Going for that outside corner. Strike. One ball, two strikes. You know, baseball can get very basic the point that the team that wins is the team that stays away from the double play. There is Geronimo. Let's watch Look Geronimo. Right. Now this is a ball that was not even hit by Freddie Lynn the last swing and you can see before the ball was hit obviously he's going toward left center field. One two pitch on the way. Line foul. Starting to say Tony and you've heard it where the managers say if you can stay away from the double play and on defense you got to cut that ball off to keep it in order. And on offense, hitting to the right side, bunting, moving the guy around. Double play, that's the real, that's the rally killer. And if you can keep it in effect when you're on defense and stay out of it when you're on offense, you got yourself a pretty good ball club. And both these clubs are able to do that. Geronimo has just kept it going here by cutting that ball off at Fisk hit. Here's the one-two pitch. Outside. Whereas you can see behind Fisk. He'll not be going anywhere. They're looking for a big sock from young Fred Lynn. Tap foul. All those outfielders as you look at him moving. Lynn hits best when he tries to go the opposite way on left handers. He appears to be trying to pull the ball more than anything else. Showed him some curveballs. He's been out in front on them. Here's an interesting situation now. Three balls, two strikes, nobody out. Fisk is on at first base. Lynn against a left hander. Do you run him? Do you keep him there? That's a right hander. I might start him against a left hander. I'd hold him, but let's see what Daryl Johnson decides. I agree with you. He's holding. Fouls it back. Bad pitch. Might have been two men on, nobody out. That was a bad pitch. But when you got two strikes on you, you can't be that choosy. There is the first base. A look at the batter and the, the angle at first base. With Fisk at first. Perez behind him. Three and two, I like the late Clemente's theory. Any pitch you can hit is a good pitch. Fisk is holding. Hot smash, almost got Fisk, a base hit in the right field. Carlton had to stop to let the ball get by him. Lynn jumped on a high pitch and drilled it in the right field. Now it's first and second, nobody out. Here it is again. Here's Fisk coming close to getting hit by this hard smash which may or may not have, we don't know for sure, have prevented him from going to third base. He said pretty sharply, Griffey was playing toward right center. Don't think he would have taken the chance. That's a pretty good arm. Pedro Barbone now has gone down to the bullpen for Cincinnati to get loosened up. Barbone. Neither Rose nor Perez looking for a butt with nobody out and two men on. Obviously, Barbone is a long middleman. Sparky used them all last night. Rose is way back at third. Nobody out. Petroselli with Evans, the on-deck batter. Nice play by Bench. 
he has done that throughout the whole series. Not only has he come up with it, watch him get his body in front of this ball to prevent it. Look at that. Hit him right in the middle of the chest protector. And then he plays it off the protector. Morgan comes in to say something to him. Might be a little stall for time. Barbosa throwing just a few pitches down in the bullpen. The string of right-handed hitters coming up. Now you infielders go there and say, come on, settle down. I want you to settle down. You go in sometimes because the manager says go in. You don't have anything to say. <laughs> <laughs> and then that pitcher runs you out of there. It's Freddie Norman, and he gives you the look he gives the catcher. <laughs> you take off. 1-0 pitch. High pop fly. Concepcion is under it. It's an infield fly. Infield fly. Petroselli is out. One away, and here is Dwight Evans. Petroselli got under that ball. Evans hit into a force play his first time up. Hit 316 in his last 48 games. He and Fisk were the two hottest hitters on this Red Sox club going through September. He's become a more aggressive hitter. At one time, he took too many pitches. Johnny Pesky has worked with him, tried to make him more aggressive. Gets by bench this time. It'll be a wild pitch, and both runners advance. And that's a big play. As good as a bunt. Looked like a screwball. For a while, it looked like all this thing was going to hit Evans. Bench just couldn't get around. That's kind of a funny pitch because usually if it's a curveball, when it hits, it would have gone to Bench's right side because it goes in the opposite way because of the rotation. That's one of those pitches as the late and so wonderful Casey Stengel used to call a 55-foot curveball. Here comes Larry Shepard. He has Barbo ready, but does he come out when they take him out? Marty's usually Sparky. No, Sparky is the man who comes out and brings the pitcher back with him, Tony, and Sparky made the comment earlier tonight that he felt like he had to have six strong innings out of Freddie Norman in this ball game. Did he give any reason, Marty? Well, he felt like he really, as you mentioned a moment ago, Joe, really went deep into his bullpen last night, and uh, he does not want to have to go deeply into it again tonight. There's Bourbon again. It's interesting. They talk about Fenway Park not having any effect on the ball game as we look at Sparky. Well, maybe they're keeping Gullet back this one extra day so he doesn't have to pitch the seventh game if it goes that far in Fenway, but they could still use him in relief to get left-handed hitters out. Red Sox forced to go with Tiant down by one. Evans waits in the pitch. Slow curveball. See Bench give uh, Carl Fisk a quick look. One ball, one strike, one out. Two nothing. We're in the top of the fourth. Cincinnati's leading. And the infield conceding one run on a ground ball. Deep to right center field. This could be trouble. Way back there. Off the wall. Two runs are going to score. Here comes Lynn. There goes Evans heading for third. There's the throw. Oh, nobody backing him up. Nobody backing him up. And luckily. Oh, well, luckily is right. Nobody was behind him. Norman was back in the plate. They're halfway in between, it seemed like. Here it is, Geronimo, the strongest arm in the outfield, throwing the strongest arm in the infield. That's Concepcion with a relay in right center field. And Freddie Norman was hung up. And Zimmer saying, whoa, wait a second, don't go and hit the screen, protecting the uh, dugouts. So there it is, all tied up at two apiece on another clutch hit by Dwight Evans. Boy, two days in a row, that big guy's come on. Now the infield has to move in. Evans is on at third base with the triple. Here's Burleson. And there's the base hit. And Boston takes a 3 2 lead. Burleson's trying for second and fix it. What a piece of base running. Seth Davidson says, no way. They took for granted that Burleson would stop at first base. Well, it's. Shows the scouting report of the Red Sox. If the ball is handled by Foster, we'll take some chances. Not on Geronimo. Burleson knows that Foster fielded the ball. Sats Davidson of the National League right there. Eating dirt with Morgan and Burleson. Here's Evans on third. With the infield in the way it was, an easy base hit had they been playing back. An easy out. Here's Burleson again coming into second base. 
Offline throw by Foster. He takes a little while to get rid of the ball, but just made it. No, not only was it a bit offline, Tony, I felt that he didn't have a whole lot on it. Kind of took for granted that he was going to stop and say, oh, baby, I just drove in the tie-break and run. That's not the way the Red Sox play, and they now lead by the score of 3-2. to two. And there's a break in the action with the score of 3-2 Boston. Luis Tian has just fouled a pitch off with Burleson on its second base. Barbon, a good fastball. Burleson, don't look now, man. Seven base hits for him. Him and Petroselli, Rico, a base hit his first time up. And Tiana, base hit in the center field. Geronimo, a good arm, and Zimmer holds him up and bench now. And look at <laughs> Tian made a big turn at first base, and nobody was there because Perez was the cutoff man, and Louis goes scampering back. Really wasn't much that Rick Burleson could do. And here again, the scouting report say, not on Geronimo. All the way on the fly. First base was open. There's Perez in the cutoff position, allowing Tian to make the wide turn at first. Burleson get hurt down there at third base. Trainers out there, Charlie Moore looking at his leg. Now out comes Daryl Johnson. He may have pulled something to be out of the game. He's limping. Well, looks. He had to pull up quickly, at, and it may be one of those quick stops because he had all the intentions of the scoring. And the, you can see it's a left ankle. And sometimes when you put those brakes on a little bit too hard, you may pull something. Here's Burleson coming off second base. He thinks he's got a chance to score. And now watch Zimmer. He's got a, well, he's holding him all the way. Right there on the artificial surface. That's where it happened. May have jammed that ankle. Didn't mean to swing, little tap. Perez can't get it, everybody's safe. It's four to two, Boston. Looked like Tony took his eye off the ball as Benitez ducked a high fastball. Barbeau makes a good pitch. Really jammed him, but Tony Perez lets it skitter under the edge of his glove. Had no chance for a play anywhere. We got a four to two game. Here's Benitez. That's a jam job. Jam city. The Red Sox get a break. Four to two, Boston out in front, and here is Denny Doyle. It's an error on Perez. Strike. Activity in the Cincinnati bullpen as Barbone delivers a fastball outside, one and one. There is Clay Carroll, the Hawk. It would be redundant to say he was in there last night because anybody who warms up tonight, you could say that about him. That's going to be playable. Pete Rose and Bench, who's going to get it? Rose takes charge. There's Tian visiting with Morgan. You don't think he's saying that's not a balk, Joe? Come on, you're making trouble for nothing. I think he's saying, how do you like my hitting and my base running? Here's Jastrzemski, three for 13 in the World Series, the Red Sox. Four to two, this is the ninth man to bat in his fourth inning. Off the handle, a little looper coming on fast, Geronimo, and can't get it. Here comes Tian. He's going to score. Benitez is held up. He had ideas of coming around. Cesar broke back on the ball. He looped around the ball, starting the left center field. That's what artificial service can do to the ball. Look at that hop. So the Red Sox have taken a three-run lead. It's 5-2. to two. And Here's the man who got it all started, Carlton Fisk. He drilled one into the gap in left center field. It was cut off by Geronimo. Fisk has taken plenty of time to give uh, Tian a little chance to breathe here. Tian's been on base both times. He walked in the third. Now he's come around to score after he singled. There is Sparky Anderson. He's given signals to his people. Barbone. I don't know what he could be giving him unless how to pitch him. 
the fisk up there, you don't look for your Stremski to be breaking. There's a high fastball, ball one. Big inning for the Red Sox. Five big runs. Outside. 2 and 0. Now, you know, that's Zimmer, very active coach. In fact, Daryl Johnson, the manager, simply says to Zimmer, go out and coach your usual game. And that means that the runners will be running. Got under it. Left center field. Concepcion, now Geronimo takes charge, makes the play. And that ends the fourth inning, a good one for Boston. Five to two in the bottom of the fourth. Red Sox out in front. Five to two, the Red Sox with five runs in the top of the fourth have taken the lead, and that's the way this series is going. And tomorrow, game five, there it is. It begins with the baseball world, and you'll get a good look at the last of his breed. Max Patkin, the baseball clown, will be our show. And then if Boston should win this game, of course, we go back to Fenway Park for game six. Game seven, there's a lot of ifs, I'll tell you something, but these two clubs evenly matched, fundamentally sound, and every game has just been a real, real battle. Game five tomorrow. Game six will begin 12.30 on Saturday Eastern time should Boston win this game. And there goes Tian into some gyrations now. He gives it a little dipsy do. He starts putting it on a little bit more when he gets ahead. Bob, let's see a few knuckleballs. Now he's starting to look around. He's got those hinges in his body all oiled up, and he'll start to flop around with that raggedy Ann arm of his. A real battler, this fella. Right field. Way back there it is. Man, he gave it a good chase. Foul ball. Evans playing toward Harris Power, which is right center field or left center field. He has a long run. Not much room there. He has to break himself very quickly. You can see the padding to prevent any injuries in that corner. He came a long way. Not much room down in those corners. Pearlson's playing short left field for Paris. Did you see that move? <laughs> he turned completely to home plate and looked at direct center field. Watch this. If you're sitting in center field, you got to see his eyeballs. Look at that. Well, one other man I know who can do what we saw in that last replay of Tion. Who? You've got him on your show tomorrow. Max Patkin, <laughs> that's right. Oh. You know, and it's calculated. It just doesn't happen. This man figures it out. Here's the 3-2 pitch. Struck him out. Foul tip held on to by Carlton Fist. That's the first strikeout. Fisk held on to the foul tip, and that's a play you just can't practice. You're lucky. One of the few plays in baseball you can't say, I'm going to go out and practice foul tips. Why are some better than others? I always felt that Yogi was good at catching foul tips. It has to be a loose webbing in the glove, and he's lucky. How can you go out and practice it? You go up and tell a coach you're going to practice foul tips. You know what he does? He'll take your temperature. It's like going out and practicing triple plays. I never understood how Yogi could do it with the paws he had. Those little nubs, huh? Oh. Johnny Bench, high curveball. I love when he put down those signals. He indicated three fingers, and he had that little stub look like two and a half. I wonder what kind of pitch is a two and a half pitch? Tian to bench. He missed outside. Marty, I'm trying to recall the number. Maybe you can. And it's a high amount of games in which the Reds have come back in the late innings to win ball games. Around 39 games, Tony, during the season. It's a lot. Fastball taken. Fisk, the low target. Oh, what a pitch that was. Right on the outside corner. Johnny Bench thought it was low. And I'll tell you, he is really upset. Look at it. Carlton did a nice job of oh. snatching the ball in a couple of inches. And he gave the umpire a good look. And John gave him a good speech. Fouls it back. 
I don't think you fool too many umpires these days by snatching the ball back in, do you? I don't think so either, Tony, except that when you you don't make your pitcher look wild, bench does it, fist does it so well, you get some of those. Left field, Benitez loses his cap but makes the play. Two away. Foster, who bounced out his first time up. You know, you, you watch the catchers move back there, and again, they give the umpire a good look because if you catch the ball coming down with the big glove, the umpire can't really see where you caught the ball. He sees the glove over the corner of the plate, and many times that's a factor. Drill foul. The difference sometimes in, in the strike and the ball is if you catch the ball in the webbing or if you catch it in the heel. It could be maybe six, eight inches in there. And if you got the glove coming down or closed off, the umpire really has to make a guess at it. One ball and one strike. Luis Tian. Five to two. The Red Sox are leading. They got five big runs in the fourth inning. How do you like that? Shook off the pitch in the middle of his windup. Two balls and one strike. As he was delivering the ball, he was shaking off the pitch. You gotta like this guy. Luis Tian. High curveball, wants a new ball. He hasn't been back to Cuba in some 16 years. He said he would like to go. Everybody knows by now his parents are here and they've seen him pitch great baseball through the month of September championship series and the first game of the series up in Boston. He knows how to pitch. Listen, his father knows how to pick off guys, too. I'll tell you that. If his father's still got the move, I'd like to use him on the baseball <laughs> world. Throw to first base and have the guy swing at it. 3 1 pitch, fouled off. You concentrate so hard on Tiant and his head fakes and the different deliveries, you forget how well he spots the ball when he has his control. He's settled down a little bit more now as the game has progressed and he's been hitting the corners. You can see fists set up, motion outside. Puts the glove down and Tion's close to it. Let's watch Fisk. Off the handle. Doyle backhands it. Long throw. Not in time. That one went in the and dugout. And it goes into the dugout. That throw into the dugout. Boston running it hit the fence. Here's Doyle showing some good rage. He didn't have time to ride himself to get good balance. Not much on the throw, but he did get a, have a good job getting the ball away. Yes, might have left the ball, uh, the bag a little bit sooner so he could have stopped the ball from going through. Yes, he was going to get his man. Foster hits a quiet 300, doesn't he, Marty? Just a steady 300. He really does, Joe. And, uh, of course, they talk about this season for Cincinnati. The big key when they talk about it will be the movement of Pete Rose to third and Foster to left field that really turned this team around. That was the move that kicked the big red machine in the gear. And here is Concepcion. Two men out, 5-2 Boston leading. We're in the bottom half of the fourth inning. Good fastball. That's the best fastball he's thrown, Tony. Burleson was telling me before the ball game that he played against Concepcion several years ago in Venezuela in the Winter Leagues. And he said he never thought that Concepcion would hit. He stood so far away from the plate, held a bat on the end, and couldn't reach pitches outside part of the plate. But Big Clue got a hold of him. Look what he's made of him. Really a, well, it's a tremendous shortstop. Hopped up. Going out. Burleson coming in. Lynn could be triple. And it's up. Foster scores. And it's a two-base hit for Concepcion. There's no reason for that ball dropping. It was a tough play for anybody who had to make it. Lynn usually comes. And gets these kinds of balls near collision. This is what happens when you get out of Fenway on this artificial surface just a shade deeper and he couldn't get it. Nobody seemed to take charge on that play. They were all reaching much like the, the same feeling you get trying to look for the light switch in the dark. Everybody was just reaching. 
when you go out as a shortstop, you're looking at the ball and you're just waiting for somebody to crunch you. And that's the way it looked, Tony, and Burleson just kind of felt his way there and cost him a run. 5-3. Here's Geronimo. Strike one. Tiant made a good pitch. Concepcion hit the ball off the end of the bat. It was a little pop fly. And the three of them surrounded it. There's some action in the Cincinnati bullpen once again. There he is, the Hawk. Strike two. This crowd is coming alive here. It's five to three now. Concepcion has hit two balls, and it really, really stung the Red Sox. He hit that five bouncer that tied it up, the one that got the grub worms in Fenway, and now this one, that little blooper. Two strikes to count, Geronimo waiting. Just missed outside. Activity. Burton is the left-hander. Pole is the right-hander. Or bones in the on-deck circle, but I'm sure if he gets on, we're going to see somebody come to the play, a pinch hitter. Crowley's been so good off the bench for Sparky. Here's a one-two pitch. Nice block by Carlton Fisk. Two balls and two strikes. That curveball broke low. Blocked it nicely. Now he's got a nice low target, just like Bench. Look at him block that ball and keep it there. I'll tell you, I said it so many times so far in this series, and it's only game four. If you're a young catcher, you can follow either one of these fellas behind the plate. Really learn a lot. I'll it back. Good fastball. You know, Joe, these two guys, you can talk more about catching than I can, obviously. These two guys prove that there's more to catching than they're just putting down fingers and throwing to second base. Oh. Well, that's the thing when you go into contract it's working the pitchers it's blocking balls it's blocking the plate there's Concepcion at second base <laughs> Tian 5-3 Red Sox lead bottom of the fourth a little looper down the left field line Benique is coming over can't get it it gets by him it'll be extra bases two for Geronimo he's heading for third here's the throw it is not in time Joe, I've got to wonder if Juan Benitez, who looked like he got a good jump, had some trouble with the lights. He, he started after the ball very well, and then he just shied away from it. You see again what happens on artificial surface as opposed to a grass field. Here's the play on the relay from Burleson to Petroselli. I believe we're going to have a pinch hitter now for the Reds. Look at that Cincinnati bench. It's five to four, and Crowley has come out in the on-deck circle. Sepsione, Foster walking by. Tiant, I tell you, a tough luck pitcher in this inning. He got the first two men easily, and then Foster hit a bouncing ball. Doyle came up with it. It was an infield hit. Foster went to second as the ball got past Ustremski, an error on Doyle. And then Concepcion, a bloop double, three outfielders converge, let it drop, and then Geronimo hit one off his handle down the left field line. And Tian now faces Crowley. Five, four. four. And Geronimo will lead. Now time is called. Hey, they're, they're going to appeal it. Safe. They appeal. They had to put the ball back in play by stepping on the pitcher's rubber, then stepping out. And the second base up by our Sats Devinson, Davidson says, uh-uh. It was a good uh, good attempt on the part of Boston because Geronimo at second base did stumble as he was watching Benicas run the ball down. Good swing by Crowley. There's Geronimo. This is his first appearance. Played in his 1973 series for Baltimore. 0 for 1 is a pinch hitter. 
Aye, one and one. Let's pause briefly for station identification. This is the NBC Television Network. One ball, one strike. Crowley, a pinch hitter for Bourbon. Strike is called a fastball. Tian trying to pitch out of it. Leads by a run. Tying run is at third. Geronimo. Let's see where Fisk spots it. Struck him out. Decoyed inside, went to the outside corner. That ends it. But at the end of four, it's Boston five, Cincinnati four. 